And welcome to Rock Paper Swords, the historical action and adventure podcast. My name is Matthew Harfey. And my name is Stephen A. McKay. We are both best-selling historical fiction authors, and together we chat about all things historical and anything that could fall under the banner of action and adventure in books, film, TV, and games. Oh, and we also talk about rock music from time to time. Our guest today is Dr. Joanne Ball. Joanne is a Roman archaeologist and battlefield archaeologist based at the University of Liverpool with a PhD in archaeology on the subject of Roman battlefield archaeology. I feel like I've said battlefield archaeology a lot of times there. (laughs) She is a regular contributor to several magazines focused on ancient history and was co-editor of Ancient World magazine and is soon to have published the um, new book, Publius Quinctilius Varus, The Man Who Lost Three Roman Legions in the Teutoburg Disaster. So welcome to Rock, Paper, Swords, Joanne. Thank you. So thank you so much for inviting me. As I say, I'm slightly intimidated uh, by the footsteps that I'm following in uh, in this, but I'm going to do my best to earn my invitation. Thank you. Welcome. I'm sure you'll be great. So we'll, we'll dive straight into the, you have the new book out. So tell us about, about it. What's it about and what drew you to the subject? Well, so it's a biography pretty much uh, from uh, the earliest uh, points in his life of uh, Publius Quinctilius Varus, who most people will know as the uh, very unfortunate commander of the Rhine legions, who in AD 9 um, lost three legions uh, in a Germanic uh, tribal attack with devastating consequences for Roman occupation in um, Germany. But I realise, I mean, I've been interested in Varus for... You know, nearly two decades now. I first came across him when I was an undergraduate uh, studying uh, ancient history. And I just did one seminar on on the Teutoburg disaster, which ended up fascinating me so much that I read everything I could about Varus, which wasn't really very much um, at the time. I wrote my uh, undergraduate dissertation about him. Uh, and from the early days, I really felt that we just didn't know enough about him that he'd been judged based on this one admittedly disastrous um, event. Uh, But in the end of his life, you know, he was in his mid-50s when this happened. He'd had a long and distinguished career behind him. And he's judged uh, by what happened in the last three or four days of his life. And almost nobody knew anything about this. So, and the book came about really, it was, uh, it was my lockdown project. Essentially, I worked out very early on that I was not suited for sourdough bread baking or for craft and all of the other activities that people were um, doing. And so instead, I decided to uh, tackle this this subject of um, virus and what we knew about his life. Initially, I kind of thought I'd only maybe get an article out of it. I I thought I'd maybe be able to piece together a few bits of biography um, about him. But as I dug more and more into the archaeological evidence, I realized that we had, we could actually create a narrative where we could place his, his his the events of his life, not perfectly. We don't know everything about his life, but from his birth right through, we can fill in a huge amount of gaps about his career by pulling in all of this disparate um, archaeological um, evidence. And so that's what I decided to do and then delivered to Pen and Sword sort of a year later, a book that was about twice as long as they were expecting it to be uh, when they commissioned it from me. Well, I'm sure that I'm sure they weren't um, disappointed. Then that sounds good. Um, um, did you have to cut a lot, or was it you left it all in there? Oh, it, it, it's all been left in there, absolutely. Um, good. <laughs> yeah, his, uh, as I say, it's it ended up being quite an exhaustive um, analysis of his life, but he was a really, really fascinating guy. So he kind of justified uh, several hundred of pages, uh, at least in my opinion. Well, sounds great. So, to give it give a sense of the scale of this disaster for which he's always, um, you know, known as Teutoburg disaster, how many men were actually in a Roman legion? Because I'm not, I'm up to scratch with that. My Roman legion knowledge is not great. So, a- around this time, the paper strength of a Roman legion is somewhere between about five to six thousand um, soldiers. But it's far from certain that this is the size that uh, of, a, of a legion sort of in reality, that um, it's quite possible that legions were were often significantly under 
under this strength, either because they've been detached off and, and there were different detachments of the Legion doing um, different off doing different jobs, or simply because problems in sort of recruitment and stuff meant that as long as they could function in the in the field, if they had 4,000, 3,000 soldiers instead, um, it wasn't necessarily uh, a problem. So we know that Varus had three legions with him um, when the disaster happened, almost certainly the 17th, 18th and 19th legions. Um, there's no historical sources that mention the names of the, um, the legions in terms of the uh, battle narrative. But there is other historical evidence that supports it being um, these numbers. Um, in terms of their strength, uh, there's there's probably somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 Roman casualties at this battle. So we're probably looking at legions of sort of between three and 4,000 uh, men uh, each being caught up in this in, in this battle. So pretty wow. devastating. Absolutely. Yeah. After writing his biography, do you feel any sympathy for Varus? I mean, from the outside looking in, it, it seems to me like it is a bit of a shame that he gets such a bad rap because he was basically betrayed by one of his own men, wasn't he? Well, kind of one of his own men. Absolutely. I mean, I've I've been suspicious uh, about the claims that were made about um, Varus's incompetence from from really early on in in studying this. Uh, it's one of the things that kind of drew me um, to this 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 subject. And yeah, I mean, he he's portrayed you know in in the ancient sources, uh, some of which are quite personally hostile to him, uh, particularly the Roman historian uh, Valeus Paterculus, who's actually a contemporary of Varus, and they actually seem to have a personal. Uh, yeah. grievance, at least on yeah. Paterculus' side. Um, he really just seems to have a, a, a visceral dislike of um, Varus. But yeah, he, he he gets the blame for this. For this, And when you actually break down the um, the events of the Teutoburg, both those in sort of the long term that lead to the discontent that leads to the, the German uprising, and then the way that Varus handles the intelligence that's brought to him about it, and then even how he conducts himself once the battle has started, he doesn't actually really do a foot put a foot wrong. He he follows protocol. He follows the orders that he would have been given from Augustus. He does exactly what he should do when the uh, especially once the battle starts. He he does essentially the, the the perfect playbook for how to escape from a Roman ambush. The problem is is that the ambush is being mounted by somebody who is an auxiliary commander himself. He knows how the Roman army works. He knows the playbook as well. And so he is able to use his intelligence about the Roman army to kind of predict what actions Varus is going to take and then take measures to render them ineffective um, in, ahead of time so that Varus puts these, these um, uh, measures into place and they don't work. And he just gets more and more mired in, in this battle. Uh, because he's got this such, such effective uh, intelligence being used against him. Wow. So I, I find it fascinating that, um, and you, you mentioned this a little bit in in the in your book. I haven't had a chance to read it in in depth, but I've sort of skimmed through yeah, the skimmed copy it, you sent us, and and um, I find it really fascinating that the, the mention that at the time the Roman um, establishment used Varus as a scapegoat. It was sort of, sort of almost like a propaganda. Um, kind of thing against you know just using virus to sort of say you know, he's the one who screwed everything up we're all great you know everyone else is brilliant cover up any mistakes that the emperor's made and that again though this battle of Teutoburg was then used again in the by the Nazis in the 20th century as a as a pro Third Reich and the the power of the German Germans against the, the Romans I suppose at this time and, and so it's interesting that he's being used at sort of two ends of a 2000 year period um for different sort of propagandist things i mean it felt quite quite unfortunate for the poor guy you know it's like every every which way but you know he gets he gets screwed over <laughs> both ends mm -hmm. of history this is it pretty much i mean yeah it, it's it is um interesting but probably not surprising how that certainly the battle of the Teutoburg has been used as a nationalist kind of cause is possibly the wrong word but a nationalist theme throughout 19th and 20th century um, Germany. So uh, Arminius, the, the, the German who kind of leads the attack against Varus, he is uh, renamed Hermann 
uh, in the 19th century because it's felt to be more Germanic. And he's sort of held up when they're trying to nation build the various states of, uh, of Germany into one uh, complete country. You know, Arminius is brought together, uh, brought into this uh, in the renamed Hermann and becomes this sort of symbol of German unity. And so Varus becomes this symbol almost of the, um, the decadent uh, Roman Empire. He, he is a symbol of everything that's wrong with the non-Germanic nations, you know, that he is lazy and stupid and incompetent, and he sort of encompasses all of that. The Nazis don't really talk too much about um, Varus, but it's their use of uh, Arminius is really interesting because up until sort of the point that um, Hitler becomes a very uh, established figure at the head of the German state, he's very keen on using Arminius as sort of a German who rises up against power, brings Germany into um, in, into prominence in, in the world and, def- you know, defends German interests. But once, uh, sort of from about 1933 onwards, once he's secure at the top of the um, state, you suddenly find Arminius not be particularly being used so much anymore because, of course, you don't want to encourage a rebel, you know, somebody who uh, mm. you, you no longer want to really support him. So whereas um, you find postcards from from Hitler's earlier career where he sort of, uh, he poses in, 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 um, in, uh, positions like the, there's a big um, statue of Hermann that's built near Detmold uh, in the 19th century, where sort of Arminius as Hermann is very heroically uh, uh, posed. It's, it's a massive statue. He's shown holding brandishing a sword towards uh, towards Rome. It's a very defiant symbol of uh, German nationalism. And Hitler apes this um, this uh, stance in some of his earlier propaganda to the degree that he'll be in the forefront doing the pose. And then you have this, the statue of, of Hermann in the background uh, doing the same pose. But you find that this starts to disappear. And so then even though you have sort of Nazi youth groups going to the to the monument and being taught about um, the the events and the sort of German superiority, suddenly the the, the aspect of rebelling against authority uh, is kind of dampened down uh, a little bit once once Hitler becomes the authority uh, himself in Germany. That's really interesting because for me, when you think of the Roman Empire and the Nazis, it's almost as if the Nazis modelled a lot of their their ideas on the Romans, you know, with the, the grand, you know, pageantry and the uniforms and everything like that. It all seems like they've basically ripped off the Romans and stole their ideas so it's really interesting that they've they've had this to start off with yeah it, it, it's such a a difficult kind of a subject of you know it's way beyond my kind of uh specialism to work out what was going on the heads uh, in the heads of nazis where they were looking yeah. at ancient history but i mean i suppose it, it's helped by the alliance kind of with with mussolini's italy that you you can sort of have you know, that after the enmity in the ancient world, you now have Germany and Italy sort of coming together uh, as as allies in in the modern world. I mean, how long that would have lasted uh, uh, is again something for other people to, to know more about than um, me. But yeah, you you sort of have this this, and I think that that's partly why Hitler doesn't after a certain point when he is uh, the authority, why he doesn't push too much about Roman incompetence in, in mm-hmm. this battle, because he's he has modelled a lot, you know, even down to the use of eagles and stuff, so yeah. so heavily yeah. in their in their insignia. You know, it's it's a difficult path to to tread. And I suspect that's why later on he does tend to step away a bit from Arminius as as his as his hero or kind of as a central hero of the Nazi propaganda and maybe moves on to uh, less problematic material. Even the the swastikas, Roman centurions used to sometimes have swastikas on their uniforms. So you did, they, yeah, they, they've taken yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah, they do. And I mean, it always surprises people. Um, you can sometimes hear kids sort of giggling, or you can see parents uh, stuttering in horror when they see sort of swastikas on Roman uh, reliefs or even on Roman mm-hmm. mosaics, and you sort of have to go, "No, it's it's not. It's not what you think it yeah. is. It's it's not." Uh, no, the Romans weren't Nazis. No, there is no conspiracy. They're not time traveling Nazis that have gone back in time and introduced this. It's not Indiana Jones or anything. It's just, you know, it's just a symbol that uh, has just been adopted Still, by two. Yeah. 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 
and it's been used all over the place. And you, when you travel, you know, I've been to Japan and you see the similar, you know, the symbols all over the temples there. And um, I mean, it's used all over the place. And in, in early medieval times, you've got the symbol of Thunor is, is, a, is like a swastika as well. And so you find it a lot in different grave goods and things from like the sixth, fifth, sixth centuries. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, how did you find the process of actually writing the book? Did you have a set writing schedule like every day or did you just fit in sessions whenever you could around your, your work? I tend to get sort of very obsessive with, with the writing thing of that I will put it off until I absolutely can't um, put it off anymore to get to my deadline. So I'm quite happy to sort of do the reading and, and sort of arrange everything in the notes, but then coming down to actually writing it was sort of a, a frenzied three month period uh, just right. before just before my deadline when I went, wow. well, I've got to do this. Three so months? Thought, yeah. Right how, how many week. words? How many words is the book? Uh, about 120,000. In three months? That's, Jesus. That's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm writing another one now and I'm desperately trying not to repeat that same yeah. technique this yeah. time around. Yeah. yeah. I would say that's probably not the the best way of doing it <laughs> no no i i have learned this but i'm, I'm going to chalk it up to an experience with, mm. with my first book and hope as i say that it won't be repeated um again. was that was that the same way that you did your phd and your dissertations at uni was it the same that you left it all to the last minute and then <laughs> i probably shouldn't admit this but then everybody including my supervisor um um already knows this um that when i was traveling into uh Liverpool University to go and print off my uh, dissertation to hand in uh, the, the hard copy of it. I was still writing the introduction on my laptop on the train in to uh, the university to print it off to hand it in that morning. Oh, so, yes. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got a friend who's um, he's, he's got a PhD and uh, he told me about the, 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 the whole thing with the thesis. And he said, I, I don't know how many, if it was a year or two that he was doing the thing. I think he said he did it all in the last sort of three weeks or month or something, basically. All of it was written just right at the end and the rest of the time, he, I don't know what he did, but, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah I think there, there, there are people inspired by deadlines and, and, and people not, and I think I'm very much, I mean, I've also been at conferences and um, I, I had for a while a reputation of, you know, I'd, I'd be put on at the end of a session in a conference because they knew that I would still be finishing off my PowerPoint uh, <laughs> at the start of the session. And so never put me on first. All right. Okay. <laughs> so as I read in the introduction, you're described as both a Roman archaeologist and a battlefield archaeologist. Um, and so have you visited um, Teutoburg as it is a battlefield and a Roman battlefield um, as part of your research or have you done a, have you been involved in a dig there? Yeah, so I was very lucky um, that um, through the, the uh, battlefield archaeology community um, to have the opportunity to excavate at, back in, in um, 2009. Uh, I excavated at uh, the Teutoburg, uh, um, which was just absolutely fascinating, uh, especially because it was the 2000th anniversary um, of the battle going on that year. So there was a lot of public engagement work. There was a lot of um, uh, opportunities to kind of discuss the battle with uh, not just other archaeologists, but with people who were visiting the, um, the battlefield as well because it's actually become quite a tourist attraction in um, Germany. A lot of uh, money was put into building a, an excellent museum. The land has been set aside of, of the battlefield. It's got a wonderful museum that displays the, the finds from the battlefield uh, on the site. And they've also done uh, a lot of landscaping around the uh, periphery of the battlefield after having checked it for um, artifacts first but that sort of tell the story of the um, battle. So they've put um, sort of slabs of rock that look like tombstones and they lead a path through uh, towards the main areas of the battlefield that have the quotes from the ancient historians describing the battle on them. So you can sort of trace the battle through uh, the landscape. Uh, it's a fascinating site. Um, but yeah, I visited it a couple of times uh, since. I, it's somewhere I would urge everybody to go if you have an interest in... Um, Roman battle. It is pretty much the, the type site really for Roman battlefield archaeology, which showed us what was possible to, to do if you excavated properly and you looked at these uh, finds in, in the right way. We learned so much more about the battle than we ever could have known from the uh, historical sources. 
And it gives you such an insight into the way that a Roman army operates in the field uh, and, and what they actually do and what happens after a battle as well. So something which is skirted over pretty much uh, universally by the Roman uh, historical mm-hmm. sources, we get some vague references sometimes, but it's almost assumed by Roman writers that their readers will know what happens uh, in the aftermath of the battle. So they don't really want to dwell on it. But of course we don't. Um, but through the archeology, span we start to get an insight into what happened you know, when the fighting finishes. And um, the cleanup kind of has to begin afterwards. So what do they do then? Because that, that kind of fascinates me as well. And I'm sure I, I re- tried to research that before. And as you say, there's not really much about it. Not just the Romans, but all, all kind of throughout history. What do they do with all these piles of bodies? Do they just march away and leave them unless they were like natives to the land and they would have to maybe burn them or something? Yeah, I mean, it, it's quite a controversial subject in some ways. Um, you... Do you get a few mentions, I say, in the Roman sources where they say, you know, we collected the dead together and and usually the sources uh, mention them being burned or sort of buried in, in, a, in a mass grave. But it's mentioned so infrequently that it's almost as if these instances are the exceptions rather than the, um, than the, the usual way. And none of the Roman battlefield sites that have been identified and excavated to date. Do we see any evidence of mass cremation or any evidence of mass burial? Which, you know, even with cremation, even if you couldn't find the um, ashes, you would be able to find evidence of a large area of burning that was sufficient to to, um, to reduce, the, you know, hundreds of corpses down to, to, to fragments and ash. So there's a growing suspicion that they did just abandon the bodies that maybe they symbolically scatter um, uh, a bit of dirt over them, uh, you know, to, to in fulfilment of, of any rituals or something. But that, yeah, even the Romans maybe um, abandon their dead. And as I say, this has been quite controversial. There's been quite a lot of arguments uh, and pushback against this because people have gone, you know, Roman soldiers wouldn't stand for it. They wouldn't accept their comrades just being left um, to, to rot uh, on enemy soil. That it would be, it would impact the morale of the survivors too much. But we just don't actually see any evidence for any other practice. Well, you know, you would think if you've just fought in a battle, even if you've won, you're going to be absolutely knackered, aren't you? And then if your commander then says, "Right, dig a massive hole for a thousand bodies, or pile up a thousand bodies, <laughs> and we're going to have to burn them," and the fuel it would take to get it going, and st- I mean, I could see why the Roman soldiers would maybe just say, oh, as you say, maybe a bit of dirt on them and a prayer and off you go and just leave them there to the animals. Uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, this this is something as well for when, when people are uh, uh, discussing uh, the disposal of the Roman battlefield dead. It's, you know, the logistics of it. When you look at uh, Roman campaigning, they don't tend to linger in, in battle areas for maybe more than 24 possibly 48 hours before they're before they're moving on in that time you've got to sleep you've got to treat the wounded you've got to collect together what you can of, of the lost materials or the weapons and the armor that have been uh lost on the field uh you've got okay you've got to eat you've, you've got, got to, to eat have, yeah yeah you've got to recover and you've got to fit all of this and burying 700 mm-hmm. people yeah. or gathering together the fuel to 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 burn them I mean, when you look at later battles, um, so somewhere like Waterloo, um, where you have the the dead are burned, uh, or some of the dead are burned um, afterwards, and the fires have to smolder for weeks afterwards. Yeah. People are, are visiting, and the pits are still still at work. So we can see it, it's not something that can just be, you know, oh well, they won the battle, they buried the dead, and off they went. Yeah. It's, it's a lot more complicated mm-hmm. than that. Um, and yeah, so far we're just not seeing any archaeological evidence that they that they do anything other than just. Uh, leave them really. I mean, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to be proved wrong. I'd love to find a, a, a Roman mass grave, but I'm not glad yet. you're saying it's that really because interesting. I was looking at it for the the book I'm writing uh, or the trilogy about King Alfred, and I was thinking, what did they do with all these people after they were? Because these are fairly big battles. Some of them are these Vikings and stuff getting killed, and you really can't find anything really written down about what they did with the bodies so I'm glad that an actual archaeologist is telling me that they probably just left them there because that's kind of what I was having them do in the book. Yeah I mean there's one uh, reference uh, to the uh, dead after the battle of Massilia I think in 101 um, BC 
and the, the dead deaths don't seem to get any kind of special treatment. But the locals comment that the battlefield grows amazing crops uh, mm-hmm. afterwards yeah. because of all the bodies. But the, the the slightly gruesome touch is that long bones from the battle uh, from the battle dead have been used to build fences and mm-hmm. and to demark land uh, nice. around the site. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, nice. So I, I think that this idea of maybe respecting the war dead is possibly maybe even an anachronism from our part that we're that we're assuming that the bodies mm. themselves had more importance than than they did um, yeah. in in reality. And I mean, there was a prohibition in in the Roman world against bringing the war dead home. You know, you weren't you weren't supposed to bring them home because it was supposed to be demoralizing for the people left at home to see the dead being uh, paraded through the streets. So we know that very little effort would have been made to, to move them anywhere from the battlefield. So just push that on a little bit further and just very little effort was made on the battlefield as well. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, sure. I mean, the Roman troops, I have, I'm have i not a specialist in Roman um, military history or anything, but, you know, I get the impression that Roman soldiers are pretty hard blokes and and that really they they would i can imagine that they wouldn't really think too much about just leaving the dead i mean they, they, these are the same people that get ordered to decimate you know troops when they break the rules or whatever you know and things like that so i'm thinking they're going to be pretty tough guys if they're the same people are capable of beating to death you know the one of of every 10 or whatever of their own fellows at the end of a battle to be set told well actually just just leave the dead we're off now because and or we can hang around and get attacked by those of locals or whatever, you know. Yeah, this, I think they're this, just gonna Yeah, I mean I, I suspect that the soldiers' involvement in it was, yes, minimal. You've you've possibly got the locals afterwards because they want to reclaim the the land if if it's uh sort of mm. agricultural or something. Maybe they clear the bodies. I mean, that's possibly what happens uh in the Teutoburg. Um there are some graves found there. But there, it's a series of uh, eight bone pits, and they've just got disarticulated human remains uh, from the battle. But they've been exposed on the surface for somewhere between two and ten years. They've got weathering marks. They've got animal gnawing on the ends oh, of wow. the long bones and things. So we know that they weren't buried straight away. Um, and if perhaps uh, I, I suspect that after a certain period of time, the Germans just want to start using that land again. And so they just sweep up the bones that they can find. They put them in a pit and, and you know, that that's that's the end of it for them. But, I mean, the, the Roman sources for that, they do suggest that Germanicus goes back um, and that he visits the battlefield and buries the, the exposed remains of the Roman dead in one big mass grave. But the area has been excavated. We see no evidence of one big mass grave. We just see these these eight mm-hmm. little pits that have maybe got about fifty individuals in them. That's all out of ten thousand plus. So it's not a comprehensive burial. Oh well. So you um. So we talked a lot about you know Teutoburg and about the the Roman um, what they do after battle and in battle there. Um, do you also, as you're a battlefield archaeologist, do you also do, uh, have you done archaeology in battlefields that are not Roman? Have you been involved in any other excavations? Not in terms of excavating them, but um, in terms of uh, studying them and sort of trying to come up with modelling that works both for later ones and and you know inevitably that I could apply back to the um, modern period. But I'm particularly interested in the American Civil War um, battlefields okay. and the American Revolutionary War um, because there's some amazing battlefield archaeology um, being done out there. Um, as long as they're sites at which metal detectorists haven't historically had too much of an interest or that reenactors haven't had uh, a go on because it can be difficult to work out uh, what archaeology comes from, from where. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's... Um, it's mainly sort of Greek and Roman that I do, but the American Civil War particularly is another area that I'm really interested in. And the, again, that you see different behaviours from those documented uh, as being sort of the ideal um, behaviours of soldiers in that period. And I mean, it's a little bit different because obviously you're working with a much richer historical source material uh, mm-hmm. when you're studying the American Civil War. You know, I sometimes want to cry when I see how much they have to work with compared to what we have uh, in, in, in doing uh, Roman battle uh, studies. But it's just uh, when you look at kind of ni- particularly 19th century uh, American warfare, so also extending into the American uh, Indian conflicts, 
and mm-hmm. uh, the type battlefield being uh, the Little Bighorn Battlefield, which is kind of where battlefield archaeology was born uh, in excavations um, at that site. And it's just amazing to see even those conflicts, you know, modern ones where you'd think we would know so much about them, the archaeology reveals stuff that we didn't even know that we didn't know, if that doesn't sound too yes, yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah, it's an interesting battle because, of course, everybody, pretty much everybody on the on the losing side of the, of the little bighorn got killed. So you, mm. you, you really have to rely on what the um the Sioux and the other tribes said afterwards, I'm guessing. But um interesting because you obviously specialize in Roman stuff and then you're talking about the American Civil War. I all my novels have been set in the early medieval period. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm now writing a novel set in the late 19th century in America. And so I'm doing lots of research about, you know, the, the um, sort of touching on bits of the uh civil war, but it's post-civil war. But um it is interesting looking at the sort of things I'm doing research, things that come along when you're talking about history that's only 150 years ago, um, where things like even I think it's just a few years ago, someone in Colorado found um, a rifle just propped up against a tree and it's pretty much in exact, you know, it, it's just there, you know, it's just been left there in like 1890 or something. And it's, and they found it in like 20. 15 or something i can't remember the exact date but somebody found it and you know they, they looked at it and it's, it's just and i think it was still loaded you know somebody had left it there i don't know why but yeah. the sort of things that get turned up in america where um i don't know a hut or you know some something has been left to the elements but it's still there you know because it's only 100 100 you know, so years later so there's things that are you know people have lived in and worked on and mm. touched that are still around yeah, it, it's so enviable. I mean, I think I think it's Gettysburg. Don't don't one hundred percent quote me uh, on this, people. But um, I think there there is a civilian casualty at Gettysburg who is a woman who who shot uh, when a, a a bullet enters through uh, the walls of her house or the um, mm-hmm. and and she she's uh, killed as a result. And so the house is still there. The bullet hole is still there. And so through doing line slice analysis, you can work out where she was in the yeah. house. So what she was probably doing at the time when she was shot, it's just, you know, and, they, and then we have to get by on sort of reconstructing <laughs> from archaeology and they, and they have, you know, the actual house that this happened in. It's amazing. So was she just working away in her house while there's this huge battles raging yeah. away? I think I would have ran away. That's yeah, about, I, th- I think I think I would have done that. She's just honest. washing the dishes or something. Yeah, so you know, it's a, it's amazing. <laughs> but bit, bit of sterner stuff. Yeah, back exactly. Then. Like, oh, these happy, these thousand guys. Yeah. Like, this war's been going on for ages. Oh. <laughs> I I, I mean, I, maybe they were kind of entertainment. I don't. I I don't know. Did people maybe. use? Did yeah. people used to go and watch them? Maybe I I don't know. I suppose if you weren't going to get caught up in it. Talking of entertainment, this is a total aside, but I was doing a bit of research about executions in London as part of this in the 19th century as part of my, the book. And um, and Thomas Cook, um, actually, you could pay Thomas Cook like, to do an excursion to go to, to in the 19th century to watch executions, which oh. I thought was quite amazing that Thomas Cook was around then and sort of <laughs> selling tickets to people, to go, taking them on an omnibus or whatever to go oh. and watch a... Oh, that's fairly good. I mean, I knew that he sort of that the company got it got an, an early start from taking coach part or you know wagon mm. parties or whatever yeah. it was to to Waterloo. Um, yeah, so well, there you I go. suppose sanatorism is is really really inbuilt to them. Who knew? But I know. Uh, I'm wow, sure people who. So... Yeah, I, I wonder if people who were sort of booking their two weeks in in Crete or something, no when, idea. When they were still yeah would have known that it was yeah. uh, based yeah. on executions and battlefields. Who knew? But. Make you make your money where you can. Yeah, this is it. I mean, it, it's fascinating, you know. Since since tourism started to emerge in the in the nineteenth century, battlefields did seem to be a, a, a big draw, and th- th- there were points even um, towards the the uh, I think it was in the Boer War, where the British government had to issue a plea to uh, British tourists saying, "Please don't go and visit these battlefields until the war is over, because <laughs> you're getting in the way and you're you're, you're you know, clogging up all the logistics. So, can you wait until the war's finished and then go and see them? Unbelievable! You know, the fascination of this kind of hot zone tourism, you know, is is not a recent wow. thing at all. We've mentioned repeatedly that you're an archaeologist, but um, I think our listeners and me 
have this idea of archaeologists is always working away on a dig like they do in Time Team. Mm. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably not exactly like that, but my favourite part was always at the end of Time Team when they would all head to the pub and have pints of real ale and a, a good laugh. Do you do much of that with your colleagues? What is your kind of daily routine life as a archaeologist like? Yeah, I mean, it, dep- it depends really uh, which bit of the world you're excavating in uh, at the time. But yeah, when, when you're on site, I mean, if it's somewhere that, that's very hot, so if you're excavating in somewhere like Spain or Portugal, you'll probably start excavating at about five in the morning. Right. And you work through till about midday and then it just gets too hot then. So you sort of have a very um, early stacked day to finish your, your your work, go for a couple of beers, go have a siesta, then, yeah, come come back out. But, yeah, one of the most realistic bits uh, of time time is the going to the to the pub and, and right. having a real ale, which I, I hated at the start of my PhD. <laughs> and that's all I really drink now uh, by the end that's of it. You, so, you've grown up. You know, you just, yeah. You've just, yeah, yeah, that's... Excellent. So, so yeah, that is that is a, a realistic bit of it, and and that's kind of one of the best bits, really. It's it's great being on site and discovering this this um all this new stuff together. But then you get around the table, everybody starts talking about their particular interests, their specialisms, and you end up with every excavation coming away with about twenty different research ideas that you and collaborations that you want to do that uh, you had no idea this would come up uh, at the start of the. Uh, of the dig and then by the end of it you know you're off in all of these different new directions which can be great and frustrating at the same time so you mentioned that you've um, done some digs in spain um, you mentioned there um, and other places hot places um what's the most exciting thing you've ever found on a dig there are some people in life who find exciting things and there are people in life who do not find exciting things and I am one of the people who does not find um, particularly um, exciting things um, the things that I have found that I that I've particularly liked though are when you find um, either fragments of Samian ware pottery so the the, the really distinctive red um, kind of semi-elite uh, Roman pottery that's often got lovely um, uh, relief decorations on it I found several pieces you know big chunks of that and it's lovely to see this you know the designs if, especially if they've got things like hunt scenes on or gladiator scenes on so they are great my favorite finds that I make though, are when you get fragments of tile and they've got animal prints on or um, footprints oh, on wow. and I love finding those and unfortunately I mean it used to be thought that this was naughty animals that had sort of scampered across these tiles while they were being left to uh to dry before being um fired we now probably think that they're letting the animals go across and to check whether they are dried out enough all right so maybe maybe it's Um. not naughty cats and dogs (laughs) but I still like the idea that it is so you know but even even if it isn't it's the idea of having something that's like directly linked to a living creature that you can see or a person or an animal that you can actually see there I mean, the one I, would have, what I would have liked to most find, I think, is from Vindanissa uh, in Switzerland. And it's got inscribed into the top of it, uh, of, of this roof tile. If you can see me, I've fallen off the roof. <laughs> so <laughs> you get nice bits of humour. Yeah, there's, also one, there's, there's one from London as well, which grasses in a, a, a colleague who says, um, my colleague hasn't been here for the last few days. He's been sneaking off instead of not working. So and, and they somebody you know incised this into the into the the tile and it got baked and used so it's great (laughs) (laughs) this is a a slight tangent here but we've mentioned the rise of artificial intelligence on the show quite a lot recently and my daughter she's 15 and she's been thinking about careers that she might want to get into it seems to me like archaeology might be quite a good one you would hope it would be one of the few careers that won't be threatened too much by ai so would you recommend archaeology to young people as a career to study towards that where where do you see archaeology developing in coming years yeah i mean in terms of the ai there there are some attempts to to bring it in uh, the main one that I've heard of is that somebody's trying to build a database so that you could just take a photograph of anything that you found um, on a site and it would be able to identify what what kind of artifact it was from, you know, and potentially where it was made and and, and fill in what it um, what it used to look like. But fortunately, yeah, because because we actually have to physically go and, mm-hmm. and dig this stuff up. Yeah, um, yeah I think it is going to be kind of one of the future proof 
um, professions as long as people still have uh, the interest and as long as it still gets the funding, yeah. uh, which is kind of one of the big issues um, at the moment. But yeah, I mean, I wanted to be an archaeologist since before I could spell it. You know, when I was five years old, I was telling people... I still can't spell it. I know, I still can't spell it either. I kept missing out the O when I was writing it today. Oh, but... When I when I handed in my uh, when I handed in my PhD, my supervisor said, "Oh, it was all great, apart from the fact you spelled archaeology wrong all the way through it." And I, for a moment, I believed him and had a panic attack. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a fascinating career. It's it's not one to go into if you want to make loads of money. Yeah, but if you want to be well, surrounded, you're speaking to two writers, so you know. <laughs> But if it's one where you want to be surrounded by great people, always do something interesting um, and and. It's, if it's something that you're passionate about, yeah, I would recommend people to uh, to do it. It's I wouldn't be doing anything else. I really wouldn't. I've, I've thought about, should I try branching to something more profitable? And just, no, no, I love what I do. Yeah. Excellent. That's good. I'll pass that on. <laughs> uh, what's me again? <laughs> what's you again? Look at that. So, it is. so I, I assume you have a love for history, obviously. Do you read historical fiction and do you have any favourite authors? We can actually, we can probably tie this into the next question, eh? Um, Because we've got, there's quite a few historical fiction novels about the Teutoburg uh, disaster or whatever. Uh, So we've got like Ben Cain's Eagles at War, Robert Fabry's Arminius, The Limits of the Empire and Geraint Jones' Blood Forest. So have you ever read anything like that? Do you enjoy that kind of thing? Yeah, I do. I mean, today you can add um, Harry Turtledove did uh, one called Give Me Back My Legions um, right. as, as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like them because they give a different spin on the the stuff. And it's great to hear other, pe- other people's opinions. And because I know how much the you know research and thought historical authors put into to their um, their writing in most cases, um, it, it's great to read them because you know the perspective that I have as an archaeologist is 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 not the defining one you know and I really enjoy reading what other people um, think about these events particularly when it is you know something that I that I know so well and it's like oh so you've taken that but and you've taken that to mean that okay that's really interesting and um, particularly the uh, you know the the, the bits in the, the heat of the battle and how sort of people have interpreted the emotions and the feelings of mm. the, uh, the the people involved. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy that kind of, um, yeah. that kind of fiction. It's been really interesting. I see there's real, I, I, I can see there's real connection between a real um, similarity between the way that an archaeologist has to think and the way that a historical fiction author has to work in that you take a few fragments and you have to kind of draw lines between them to work out what was happening and, and the, the context and, and how things like at the timeline between things. And, and it's the same, you know, like you say, you take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and then we have to try to work out a narrative that makes sense um, mm. to a story, but also makes sense, you know, in, in the real world and within the confines of the ge- geography of a site or whatever, um, based on snippets of information, because we don't have all the information, unless I suppose you're writing, I suppose further and further into history, like later into history, like we were saying, like the nineteenth century. If you're writing about a specific battle, there you might have a huge amount of information, so you might be able to pinpoint exact movements, you know, of, of troops and things. But um, when you're looking back into Roman and you know early medieval periods, it's it's very much about joining the dots, I think. And mm. I can imagine it's very similar sort of thought process. Although we maybe we've got a bit of extra leeway in that we can <laughs> you know, bend. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm quite envious of that, really, because um, you know, there's certain things that I that I think based on the um, the reading and, and and what I what I think is is the case and why something has happened, but certainly the the academic side, you know, I have to not mention these speculations. I got away with it a little bit more in the Pen and Sword book because I'm presenting this. This is my my take on it. Um, but things like at, at the Teutoburg, um, one of the unusual things about the central bits uh, of the battlefield, you know, where there, there's sort of a culmination of the battle and there's probably a mass slaughter of, of Roman soldiers. And after this, everything sort of disintegrates and it's every man um, for himself. Uh, unusually for a Roman battlefield, we don't find really any uh, Roman military sandal nails, which are usually scattered all across um, Roman uh, battle sites. and. I think 
but this, you know, it, it, it's a speculative thing. But I think it's because they've lost their shoes by this point. You know, they, they've all been they've been fighting through mud and, and terrible conditions for three or four days. We see in later warfare that this is something that, that typically happens at people when they've been going through this kind of long running battle that they often complain about losing their footwear. And so I think that this is something that's happened to the Roman soldiers by this point, And that's why we don't find the nails. But I can't, you know, I can think that, but I can't argue that as a as a academic point. But if I was writing a novel about yeah, the, the yeah. thing, that's you'd absolutely losing, something. Yeah, you'd have them all losing their shoes and yeah, come yeah. On, yeah. in a historical yeah. note, and you'd say, well, the archaeology has no nails, so I've decided they yeah. all lost their shoes, and yeah. Yeah, so you know, I, I I think that's that's the great thing about historical fiction is that you can take the the evidence and you can see what you think fits the that best mm-hmm. in terms of your characters and the development of the story and so you know i'm really jealous of being able to do that really but well we've got we've got actually a, another question um to follow on from that really was you've written this non-fiction book and you said you're jealous of historical fiction authors so would you consider or have you thought about writing historical fiction i did start a draft um I, i'm trying to write a novel about virus actually um probably about five or six years ago before, before I sort of conceived of writing this um, biography. But it sort of didn't go anywhere because I couldn't work out what the characters should be. I couldn't work out whose sort of perspective to tell it from. And then I read some of the other people who'd written novels about it and I just couldn't see what I could sort of add to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's something, you know, possibly, I, it, it's, it depends on if I can kind of come up with an angle Um that sort of hasn't been addressed in in those um, elements uh, and and those previous publications before, but yeah, I mean it do, it does sound intriguing um, to do it. Uh, yeah, maybe it's maybe it can be a project. With your writing styles, certainly, I mean it's not it's not dry or anything like that. The writing style is really good. It's, it's an entertaining book. I've only skimmed it, but um, yeah, yeah, the writing style is I... definitely there. I think you could easily transfer that to fiction and and do a good job of it. Yeah, I, I'd agree because I only dipped in and out of the book, and and you find yourself when it's entertaining reading. When if you dip in, yeah, you, end you end up, up reading more than you want exactly. to read. Like, yeah. You know, I didn't have much time, and I was thought I'll just read a couple of lines here, and I ended up reading a couple of pages. That was the and same, sort of yeah. Drawn in, so it is. It is really, really interesting. Really well written, mm-hmm. the book. So that's great to know. Thank you so much. Yeah, maybe maybe I will have to sort of yeah, revise this as my next project. Okay, yeah. well, I've got another little kind of tangent here uh, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to the academic establishment might not like it but um, being on an archaeological dig especially like battle sites with so much history and death around it have you ever had any weird like paranormal experiences not myself personally and I would absolutely love to have one you know I, I'm there every time going oh if the ghost of virus could appear to me you yeah. know in, in my sleep like he's supposed to have done to, to people uh, in antiquity that would be um absolutely amazing but you know from other people who work on battlefields yes mm-hmm. they have they have reported particularly at American Civil War sites they have mentioned um seeing things hearing things of but it's one of those things, going back to what we said before, we finish a lot of our evenings drinking ale in the pub. So whether those two things are related or not, um, it, trying to discern that is, is possibly the... Um, the you know. that, that would be used as the excuse. Although, I mean, I've, I've drank a fair bit of beer over the years and I've never seen a ghost. It's an interesting thing about the thing where there's a, where there's a lot of death in one place and whether there's like strange vibes and things. So I remember... I went to um I used to live in Spain for a long for a long time. I lived in Spain and um near Madrid there's a place called Valley of the Fallen, um, mm. which is um a two it, I think it's where until very recently, I think actually Franco was buried there. I think they've moved his body now, just just very recently. Um but it was it, it's this amazing mausoleum built into a mountain, and it was built after the Civil War. And they used um, many of the um, prisoners of war from the Civil War to build it, and thousands of people died building this this thing. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's got a cross that's so big above it, you can see it from like twenty miles away, and it's very much this sort of when you go in, it's like something out of, out of the mines of Moria or something. You walk in, and it's got these huge like uh, again this um, the this, this sort of um, Nazi style 
um, statues of, of yeah, huge people yeah. with swords and things. I mean, it's very, very it's strange. brutalism. Is that, is that what they I don't it? know. Yeah, maybe. It's anyway. It's 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 huge. It's incredibly impressive. But I went there as a teenager for the first time and went into this place and I and I had to go out. I said I can't stay in here. It's got such a strange. Right. I didn't really know the history about it. But afterwards, reading about how many, I think thousands of of um, prisoners of war um, re- on the Republican side, I guess. Um, a, um, would died in the making of it because they didn't care. They just were basically used them like slave labor. And if they died, I think they just got buried like in a mass grave inside the mausoleum, like in one of the side crypts or something. Yes. And um, and it just had this incredibly oppressively strange vibe. And I could appreciate the the, the sort of the the majesty, if you want, of the of the building itself, the construction. It was incredible. But but yeah, I couldn't stay inside. It very strange feeling. Um, and obviously, the Spanish people feel very strongly about it. It's, it's a real. It, it 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 attracts people who are pro Franco and pro fascism, and it Ooh. and and that's why I think they've moved his body um, because it became a real symbol. For, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Anyway, bit of an aside, but yeah, I mean, with, with Roman sites, um, some of them, you know, especially where they do become uh, associated not just with ba- with battle, but with um, kind of tragedy, particularly uh, siege sites. So, so particularly the ones that are in sort of um, modern uh, Israeli territory. Yes, uh, like Masada, like, like Masada and places, and places yeah, 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 where you have, you know, I, I think a lot of um, a lot of stories associated with them. And in fact, from one of the uh, siege sites, uh, from uh, the site of Gamla, so also a siege during the uh, first Roman Jewish War. About a decade, maybe maybe fifteen years ago, there was a tourist who stole some ballista balls from some Roman ballista balls from the site of um, from Gamla, and they took them home with them, thought nothing of it, and then they returned them anonymously with a note uh, that said, "I'm returning these because my life has been a nightmare since I took them. I have been plagued by nothing but trouble uh, since I take them. They're wow. cursed, so take them back. I, I don't want them." That sounds yeah. familiar. It's a bit like the yeah. Hexham Heads. That's that's a similar kind of story, uh, although they were fakes. But yeah, yeah it's the, yeah from a, from from a few from a few siege sites, particularly the the, the ones from the first Roman Jewish War. There have been antiquities stolen, and then people mm-hmm. complaining that they've been sort of haunted afterwards. Yeah, uh, a terrible like, curse oh. attached to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, which is uh, it's really, really quite an interesting idea. I like yeah. the idea of these uh, the ghosts of these Roman soldiers. Um, plaguing people until they send the stuff back again <laughs> yeah. sells them right yeah mm. wow makes you think that you go around the british museum how many ghosts there, would there be there all the stuff has been stolen from all over the world but uh, anyway let's not go into yeah no whole, comments uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> but um anyway um We've sort of come to the end of our time together um it's been fantastic yeah that's really quickly <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's been amazing. We've got two sort of final questions that we ask everybody. Um, so at the end of every interview, we ask people, what have you been um, reading and watching recently? Have you got any recommendations? So my, my read at the moment is one that I've been waiting to come out in um, paperback for ages. For me, hardbacks are for academic work and paperbacks are for my uh, leisure reading. So I tend to wait for um, paperbacks. I'm reading Terry Pratchett's um, biography uh, at the moment, right. which uh, I'm just finding really fascinating. Uh, he's one of my favourite um, authors. He's somebody, um, when he died, I was absolutely devastated. Uh, I have, of his last book, I haven't even read the last chapter because I want there to be some Terry Pratchett yeah. in the world that I haven't read. Right. And so I've never read the last chapter. So I'm reading his um, his biography at the moment, which is absolutely excellent and recommended to anybody who uh, likes his books. Uh, in terms of watching... Um, I tried watching that Sixth Commandment program along with probably mm-hmm. everybody uh, in the country and after about 10 minutes I had to turn it off because I thought, no, I can't. You know, I, I'm a battlefield archaeologist and I deal with warfare all the time, but that was too uh, grim for me. So uh, my watch at the moment is uh, the new series of Black Mirror uh, on on Netflix. I'm kind of plunging into that um, at the moment. And to be honest, it's not much more cheerful than the, yeah, um, the yeah. Sixth Commandment, but at least... At least I know this stuff hasn't happened yet, so <laughs> it's it's a little bit a uh, little bit yeah. less bleak, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it's... just as an aside, there on the Netflix thing, you just reminded me. Have, have you watched the um, Barbarian series on uh, Netflix about the Tutorberg? 
I I have. Mm. I well, I've watched the first season of it. Uh, I was roundly recommended by everybody that I knew, including some people who worked on the uh, second series, uh, not <laughs> to not to um, watch that one. The first, I I mean, I thought it did a great job in terms of framing the dilemma that um you know Germans serving in the Roman army must have faced the problem of this kind of dual identity am I more Roman when the Romans are oppressing the people that I came from you know which which one should I sympathize with yeah. and the kind of pulling uh from both sides that they would have had I just thought it was such a shame that they dealt with the battle so so poorly yeah. that you know it was it was very badly um shown they made it seem like it was just one single engagement they didn't show the the, the running battle for three or four days that it actually was and they they made virus seem like quite a night nice, just like everybody else does um a naive incompetent person who was just brutal and and stupid and um brought everything uh, upon himself but in terms of the German stuff, I, I really liked it. Although apparently I've heard, if you watch it in the original German and you are a, a German speaker, they all speak with really hipster Berlin um, accents. Uh, apparently, <laughs> so, so I know quite a lot of Germans who watched it in the English dubbing because they said, I can't have the, 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 the accents that they've got yeah. on this show. It's just That's funny because the, the, Romans, the Romans speak in Latin, don't they? Yeah, it? they do. Um, so yeah. I don't I don't know how that sounds to sort of the Italian ear, but I know that the German uh, doesn't apparently does not sound good. Well, we've got one final two part question that we ask everybody. What have you been listening to recently? And do you listen to music when you're writing your, your book? So it's the summer for us, you know, much as the, the weather outside is um, yeah. trying to convince me that it's not. So summer is when I fall back on uh, either Latin American music, so a lot of sort of Buena Vista Social Club and that kind of thing, or I try and recreate my teenage festival vibes by listening to lots of 1990s and 2000s pop punk. So yeah, it's been yeah. a, a lot of that on the uh, on the stereo recently. But no, not when I write. Um, when I write, absolute silence. I can't, right. I don't. I even put, um, if I'm trying to do a particularly complicated bit, I even put earplugs in so that I can't hear anything. Uh, I'd love to be one of these people that could write to to music or to soundtracks. I think it would be great. But uh, for me, no, mm. I have absolutely nothing on. Music so, on so I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to say Gladiator, you know, Hans Zimmer's Gladiator music, and you'd be like, yeah, I'm writing it, listening to it. Oh, I, I, would, I, would, I would love to. I mean, I listened to that, you know, at, at points when I sort of uh, – walking to and from places trying to work out ideas mm -hmm. in my head i'll listen to the music yeah. but when i when i'm writing no it's for some reason it's just got to be absolute silence which irritates me because it's very <laughs> difficult to get absolute silence in this world yeah, exactly that's yes. why i yeah. don't even attempt it yeah. yeah 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 it would be great although i've never tried just earplugs though maybe that's a good plan maybe that's a good idea just to stick well, i think you some... would you would hear the blood rushing in your head, I think, Matthew. This is the problem. Just, yeah, it would yeah, really distract me. <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you get stressed, you, you you work out the point where your sort of blood pressure is building because you can start right. hearing it in, the, in, the, in, I've, in I've your ears. Got, yeah, I've got quite a bit of tinnitus as well from rocking, I think, listening to rock music and stuff. And I think um, that I, I would hear that a lot. Like with listening to music, obviously, you don't yeah, masks really hear it. that. It, covers, it masks mm -hmm. it, but I think otherwise I'd be listening to the whistling and hissing in my, in my head. What's going on? <laughs> What is that? Yeah. Oh, it's just you. I guess you're both people who listen to to music when you write. Then, yeah, yeah. Matthews, he's very much like the gladiator themes and that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, those sort of things. Yeah, theme theme music, you know, sort of orchestral music and mm. um, yeah, th stuff like that. White white noise as well. So I listen white, to like yeah. rainfall mm. and, and thunderstorms and things like that. But um, Stephen mm. listens to more interesting. Yeah, I listen to black metal. Oh, okay. It's basically like yeah. Matthew said. It's like white noise. It's just a mm. loud kind of noise. There's not much melody. So you can concentrate on what you're doing rather than a kind of a jaunty tune that makes you want to stand mm -hmm. up and dance around and sing along or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. this is the problem. If I was listening to a yeah. soundtrack, I'd just stop writing and I'd go watch the film instead. So you know, <laughs> it would be a dangerous yeah, well, road to go yeah. down. Yeah, I try to. We we try to recreate the sort of the movie, I guess, in on, on paper. You know, mm. <laughs> some, something, some sort of trying to take the elements of that. The, yeah, the, the emotions. The, yeah, the emotions and you know the way we we mm. felt when we were watching it. So maybe sometimes you can f sort of tap into those emotions. Yeah. It's, it's, anyway. It's, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, it's been fantastic. Yeah, that was really interesting. I think um, you said at the beginning that you were a little bit uh, nervous or um, because of the you're not a historical fiction author, but I can guarantee that people listen to the podcast will be interested in everything we've talked about. And um, so, and best of luck for the book that um, comes out on the end at the end of August. Is it? Yeah, yeah, due on the thirtieth. 30th of August it's it's due and you know maybe the the fictional adaptation of it in a couple of years time who knows all oh, right well we'll watch <laughs> that then and anyone yeah. that's interested in <laughs> Roman history um and especially um Varus and the Teutoburg um disaster um get the book and Publius Quinctilius Varus thank you so much thank, thank you Joe. thank you thank you both that's it for today's episode we hope you've enjoyed it if you have please take a moment to leave a review on whatever platform you're listening on and don't forget to subscribe let us know if you have any questions or things you would like us to cover in future episodes we're on facebook facebook.com forward slash rock paper swords podcast and x at rock underscore swords you can find out more about our books on matthewhartley.com and stephenamichai.com the theme music is written and performed and copyrighted by us. Until next time, a rock, paper, sword. It's goodbye from me, Matthew Harfey. And it's goodbye from me, Stephen A. Mackay. And remember, whatever action and adventure you have going on in your life, be kind. Stay safe. And happy reading. And now, here is a trailer for another brilliant podcast, so give this a listen. Matthew and myself have both been on this, so check it out. I'm Sharon Bennett Connolly a best-selling writer of historical non-fiction specialising in women's history. And I'm Derek Burks, best-selling writer of historical fiction set in the medieval and late Roman periods. Together, we host the podcast series A Slice of Medieval, which offers a fusion of history and historical fiction. We invite special guests, authors such as Bernard Cornwell, Elizabeth Chadwick or Ben Cain, to talk about the historical context of their books. Or we talk to historians such as Catherine Warner or Darren Baker who can offer an extra insight on their specialist topics. We try to adopt a fresh approach and often examine rather overlooked periods as well as coming at familiar topics in a different way. If you're interested in history, historical fiction or writing history, this may be the podcast for you. Occasionally, we do go rogue and present a topic outside the medieval period, so watch out for those episodes. You can find A Slice of Medieval on your favourite podcast provider. Why not have a listen?